as a place where uh, image is, uh, is carefully controlled um, and, and maybe it's difficult, uh, an extra difficult place to, to do filmmaking. Um, can you talk about your experience in that respect? Well, I think it's a place of uh, many contradictions. I made maybe six or seven films in Russia in the past, but it, it's constantly evolving, constantly changing, and constantly to defies expectations and certainly my expectations. And this would be a case in point at a time when we were making the film this um, in uh, late uh, 2013, you know, was, was when the Maidan protests were just breaking out, when the, the conflict was, uh, was uh, brewing up in eastern Ukraine. And many people felt that, the, you know, Russia was becoming more isolationist, the doors were, were, were being closed. Well, that wasn't our experience here, you know, uh, it's um, quite a long story to explain how we got access and it took a long time. But the key was when, when Vladimir Urin, who features heavily in the film, came in. He wanted to make transparency a, 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 a basic part of his new philosophy. And once we convinced him of our sort of bona fides, and that we wanted to make a film for the cinema, which was crucial in winning his support, we, um, we had unfettered, uncensored access, and there wasn't anywhere we couldn't go, and anyone we couldn't speak to. And, and Nick, you're also the cameraman uh, in this film. Uh, can you talk about your approach to, to capture all these really beautiful images? Well, you could say I was a pig in clover, you know, uh, especially uh, when you got close to the stage, they, they talk about stage in really reverential, almost religious terminology. You know, that it's the altar at which they pray and an audience come and pay worship. And I kind of felt a bit like that. You know, there was, I think I must have covered 20, maybe even 30 performances. And there wasn't once um, when I ventured backstage when I didn't feel an incre incredibly privileged perspective. It was a really magical place. So, Capturing those images was really just a technical challenge of how to do it in, in you know, virtually pitch black, you know, had these very fast, fast lenses. And wanted to kind of capture a sense of that sort of dialogue and nervousness and nerves and fear backstage as a starting point to try and get a rather intimate and observational uh, portrait of them at work. And then when we went into the rehearsals, it was just trying to get um, the, uh, the unguarded moments, not to compromise them, but just to get them um, uh, in, a natural, in a natural way. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. If you have one, raise your hand, and I will call on you if I'm not seeing you. How, how did you decide which dancers to feature more prominently in the film? Sure, it, it was very tough. I mean, this, because uh, when we approached them, they the, the Bullshit Management, they were actually very keen that we, we made a film about the entire theatre. Well, there's 3,000 people that work there. So 250 uh, people in the ballet company. And we didn't mislead them, we knew our focus was on the ballet company. But, um, so we spent a good month just talking to people, occasionally getting the, out the camera to sort of just establish a presence. And to a degree they were self-selecting. Some, there, there was a... Uh, a company that was very keen to put the traumas of the previous season and the acid attack behind them. So some people were, many of them were, were very unwilling to, to talk about that. Would only want, want to talk about the present and, and sort of future tense. And obviously we, we, we needed people who could also address the past. And so we spent a long time and we followed several um, dancers who don't appear in the final cut, trying to whittle it down. And uh, Anastasia Meshkova was the first who, who we felt we were able to sort of win, win trust, which is of course a crucial part of what we do. And um, then uh, Maria Alash became very frank with her, us and, and became, um, uh, we developed a, a, a strong dialogue with. Maria Alexandrova didn't really appear until about halfway through the, through the season because of her injury. And to begin with, you know, she's, um, She's a senior member of the company, and hence she was quite grand, you know, and everyone um, uh, gave her a lot of respect. But um, she eventually, I think, we convinced her to speak on behalf of the company. And I think once we've done that, then she started opening up to us. So it's really just a question of slowly, gradually building 
re relationships and dialogues with these people over, we filmed for about five months over the, across nine, which is the span of the season. Question right here. Um, the tensions within the company, did that create any obstacles for you? Uh, yeah, very much so. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, that's what we, we tried to capture on the camera. I'm not saying we did it all the time. You know, there were, um, I mean, I don't think there were many sort of um, full-blown arguments that you know we overheard or missed. But, uh, but it's a dance company. You know, there were things. Uh, you know, there are there are artistic temperaments, and I think sometimes the relationship, which, for instance, between the ballet masters and mistresses, what they call the pedagogues, and their and their pupils. They're, they're, they're quite um, direct, shall we say, you know. But those are, uh, again, uh, those are things in common with any dance company. What we were very intent on doing is trying to explain what makes the Borshaw unique. We did not really want to go, go into this trying to make a film about a dance company because we felt those films had, had been made. Good question. Did, did your interest in the film precede the acid attack or was it spawned by the acid attack? Just got lucky for the acid attack. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we got extremely lucky because uh, I'm based in London. Uh, the person who really broke it all the access and my, my colleague and, and close companion in this journey we've made, Mark Franchetti, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, um, li lives in Moscow. And together we were making a film, a very dark film, that was at Hot Dogs um, last year called The Condemned, about a prison in the north of Russia. We were on our way in, in the van back from this prison in the middle of nowhere in the north of Russia where the news broke about the acid attack. So to answer your question, our, our interest was, uh, was triggered completely by this breaking news story. And Mark is very well connected and, and managed to sort of get us in for about a day and a half, quite soon after the attack, uh, the, the, the news reports about the attack had happened. Within the first two weeks, I think, of, of the story breaking, we were in. But only for a sort of day and a half, and before they, um, the, the Pavel Dmitrichenko had been arrested, when the theatre realised that there was one of their own that was being accused of this crime, then the shutters came down, and they came down for about six months. In fact, it was only when the Kremlin ousted um, Exonov, the, 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 the former director, and, and replaced him with Vladimir Urin, that we were able to get back in. Uh, the question is, uh, do, you, do I believe Pavel Dmitrichenko was guilty? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, I, I mean, he's pretty much confessed, and I believe that confession. Now, I know there's a lot of confessions within the Russian judicial system that I, I would question, but this one, I, I think, um, uh, as we say in English, he was banged to rights. So he was, um, you understand, uh, and the film perhaps doesn't do a great job in explaining that he, he employed two thugs to actually throw the acid, so he wasn't physically there. And there are many, there's not a lot of speculation about his motivation. Character that appears briefly, and I would have liked to develop more, Nikolai Tsitskolidze was very much, um, I think, involved in, 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 in what led up to the acid attack. I'm not saying he was directly uh, guilty, but he was, there was a very, a very poisonous atmosphere that I think uh, lay behind the crime. And here was a question about the correlation between what happens in the Bolshoi and what we can observe in larger Russia. <coughs> it was something we spent a massive amount of time talking about in, when we were editing. You know, is the Bolshoi a, a mirror of, of, of Russia? Is, does it reflect what's going on outside? It's, it's complicated because as many times as we thought it was, it was doing that, then we'd think, well, actually, no, it, it's different. It, it's different. I think well, the truth of it is that there's aspects of what goes on inside the Bolshoi that are part of the DNA, sort of Russian soul and that, and, and that political behavior that goes towards issues like patronage and influence and the sort of oblique references to <coughs> corruption. So that is in common. But then what you have is also a, a very hermetically sealed sort of bubble. So as I say, you know, the whole Ukraine crisis was, was blowing up while we were there. Well, there's barely a television inside the building. And certainly the whole subject was not being talked about. So it's a complicated issue. I can't answer it really very simply. I'm afraid. But that's a good question. <laughs> a anyway, did you hear what is the meaning of Babylon? Babylon the name. Well, in certain cultures, and, uh, and perhaps it's perhaps slightly more 
evocative in the UK, I don't know uh, why. Babylon speaks to a decayed and corrupt state. It's obviously a biblical precepts. It's been adopted by Rastafarian religion and used in the same con context. And it was difficult to come up with a title that uh, you know didn't have lots of words in it that try to try to hint at uh, the darker side of our story. So that's why we arrived at Babylon. Right, the question refers to the title card at the end that says "Your Gay Feeling." Was like, go and sure. what does he do now? Well, it's obviously very recent, and I haven't been inside the building to, to understand it um, in, in great detail. But my understanding, well, most most of it comes from my understanding comes from what you've seen in the film. That that there was obviously you know history between Vladimir Orin and Sergei Fulin, and I was trying to pin Fulin down as we were filming. He's an extremely evasive and very divisive character. Uh, I'm not. You know, many people would agree with me. I think he's a sort of tortured artist that probably, you know, has questionable management skills. So I think all of those I'm speculating added up to an equation where uh, Orin didn't feel he's the, the best person for the job. And you know, they they like to reinvent themselves. They they they, they want to move on artistically as well. And I think they, they there's a struggle inside the bullshit between traditionalism, modernism, isolationism, and appealing to uh, an international audience, and maybe they felt he wasn't the best person to take them forward. Time for one or two more questions on Scott right here. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we interviewed um, previous uh, artistic directors. In fact, there's one of the, the, the elderly ba ballet master, um, his name eludes me for a moment, but the plainly growing hair, but anyway, he, he was a former artistic director, and he he testified to you know calls from the Kremlin trying to influence his casting decisions, and that was some 30, 30 years ago that he was artistic director. So some of it is very much a continuum of how the Bolshoi is used as a political pawn, and how people from outside try and influence what's happening inside. So several films in Russia. Are there things uh, in Russia that you'd like to take on in the future, if you could? Not just yet, actually. <laughs> this, this is by, by, by a country mile, the hardest uh, film I've, I've ever made, and certainly in, in Russia. In, in, the, in the access film, it's, um, you know, it's, it's tough to get into places like this, and, and that's tricky, but, but it's the renegotiation on every day that, that um, makes it challenging. And Russia's fascinating, endlessly fascinating, constantly evolving, and, and, and yeah, I'd love to make another film there. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is the film's world premiere uh, here at the Toronto International Film Festival. You're only the second audience uh, to see it. Uh, please go spread the word. Uh, there's four more days of film uh, going ahead. I hope you get to enjoy more. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Thanks, especially. Yeah. I have one question. <laughs> the lady who's chicken, I get <laughs> Did you like it? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here.